Campbell, a space to debate, study and celebrate architecture. Um, okay, we are very happy to host tonight at Campo Gabriele Mastrigli for this amazing lecture about Campo Marcio. We will use this lecture as a closing event of the exhibition Unbuilt Rome that actually uh, try to um, um, understand the city of Rome analyzing a series of projects unbuilt. And so we thought that probably it was um, an amazing um, also occasion to uh, speak about probably one of the most important unbuilt projects of Rome, that is the Campo Marcio of Piranesi. So thank you, Gabriele, for this um, lecture. We are very happy about your work, and uh, we are really happy about the fact that uh, Gabriele is one of the most important friends of Campo. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Matteo. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Actually, uh, the idea of the, uh, of the lecture today um, yeah, is to, to talk a little bit about uh, a project that actually could be the premise for uh, everything that is here um, in the gallery now, but also um, uh, a project that, that in a way has been one of the most uh, um, traditional obsessions of uh, uh, architects since uh, they uh, since uh, its, uh, its age, uh, the period in which it was produced. Um, actually, I, I, I would like to say that um, for me, talking about the Campo Marzo is um, it's a sort of, uh, um, yeah, I have an ambiguous attitude towards the work of Piranesi because actually I discovered it in a very direct way and, and this is actually the first slide uh, um, of, uh, and it was in 1996 when I uh, had to decide if to take the military service or the community service and of course I chosen for the, the community service and was, um, uh, um, was asked to work for the uh, Istituto Nazionale per la Grafica uh, that is the Calcografia Nazionale, is nearby uh, the Travi Fountain, one of the national institutions of the Ministry of Culture. And I discovered that uh, this institution had uh, the complete uh, collection of Piranesi's, uh, not only prints, but also and especially copper plates. Basically, Piranesi was, was there. And uh, at the time, the institution was very much working uh, um, on, on it. This guy, actually was Antonio Sannino, the last uh, official printer of the Calcografia, who was in charge of uh, producing uh, prints from the copper plates uh, of the collection. And he was the one that, for instance, worked until 2008-9 for re-printing uh, the Piranesi plates uh, in the occasion of an important exhibition that took place in 2009. Uh, with the name <coughs> Nolli, uh, Nolli Piranesi and Basi, and was about the uh, modern Rome, the uh, representation of modern Rome. Antonio Sannino died in 2012, and uh, since then, actually, um, yeah, uh, the Calcografia missed uh, a very important person. The other important person uh, that um, uh, I had the possibility of working with uh, in this year at the Calcografia Nazionale was Luigi Ficacci, who, worked, who was in the Calcografia at the time working uh, uh, in this huge, uh, incredible um, work of the uh, complete catalogue of the Piranesi uh, hatchings and, and, and plates, and that finally in, 2000, in the year um, 2000 came out uh, uh, with this book that I know everybody has seen in the, uh, in the bookshop, <coughs> edited by, by Taschen. Um, so, uh, this is just to say that uh, I, I came in touch with Piranesi in a, in a very, very direct way, without knowing so much, because when I studied architecture at the University of La Sapienza, Piranesi was not actually uh, something that was 
ton about. Um, and so I discovered um, in, in this very um, uh, immediate way that's allowed me also to, uh, to in a way, try to understand what was the, the meaning of this very strange kind of representation of things, of Rome, that was something that was much more than simply views of the cities and, uh, uh, and archaeological uh, investigation about the, the past uh, of the imperial uh, Rome. Piranesi, actually, the Campo Marzio can be understood only if we go through uh, Piranesi's life. Actually, P Campo Marzio was, I think, a sort of uh, point of arrival um, uh, of uh, the history of this uh, Venetian architect that came to Rome, especially for, for in a way, investigating what he, he uh, thought was the, um, uh, the fundamental um, starting point for, uh, for architecture, and, and, and namely uh, Roman culture. Um, and in fact, um, all the work of Piranesi is punctuated by uh, elements that talk about himself. Uh, this is, for instance, the frontispiece of one of its most important work, Le Antichità uh, Romane, who he, he decided to put himself. Actually, this is a portrait f from, from uh, another guy, from F Felice Polanzani, but uh, in a way that was the, uh, the idea. No? Um, an architect that tells uh, that makes a very uh, scientific work, uh, but at the same time with a very personal attitude, the autobiographical uh, attitude. Um, actually, um, as a Venetian architect, um, Pianesi was very much influenced by what was around him. His father was a stone mason, Taglia Pietre. Uh, his brother was a, a monk, a Carthusian monk, that initiated him to the Roman culture, and his uncle was an engineer working for the um, for the wooden magistrate of Venice, il, ma le, il magistrato delle acque, and working especially in the famous sea walls of Venice, i murazzi. So, in, in a sort of um, uh, kind of a project that at the same time uh, uh, in, in the field of infrastructure, but also very very uh, strong architecture. And um, among the, the many, many references that uh, influence very much uh, um, Piranesi's, uh, the young Piranesi, maybe the most important ones was uh, Giovanni Antonio Canal, uh, better uh, known as Canaletto, who was basically the inventor of a sort of a kind of uh, uh, attitude of uh, depicting uh, the city, in the, the case the city of Venice, but not only. Uh, first of all, by talking, by uh, depicting, by painting directly outside. But and, and this is the case of his first uh, uh, work, painted work. But also, uh, um, uh, in the um, in the second part of his career, he started uh, uh, engraving also, and this series, especially of the engraver um, called the Dute. That were, um, that were published in 1744 was very important for Piranesi because uh, Canaletto uh, worked, uh, um, especially in the, in the next one we can see, uh, in a sort of uh, idea of um, views that at the same time are very precisely uh, reproducing the reality of Venice, but also changing some aspect in order to producing an invention, something that do not exist at all, but still is very uh, realistic and very uh, credible and therefore convincing. Uh, the characters of, of these views of Canaletto for Piranesi were incredibly important, but also the idea that these are, uh, the idea that the etchings are um, in a way something that's very different from paintings, you know, because they are producing multiples, and they, they are books, basically, and they have a very large um, um, uh, diffusion uh, all over the world. And together with this, actually, um, 
Canale, um, Piranesi arrived in Rome in, in 1740 uh, um, following uh, the ambassador, um, the Venetian ambassador uh, to the, um, for the Republic of Venice in uh, the state of the church. Um, and uh, um, in a way he started uh, looking uh, around, uh, founding uh, uh, a job, and um, the first one was working for Giuseppe Vasi, who at the time was the most important uh, uh, um, figure in the representation of, of Rome, but also he came in contact with Gian Battista Nolli. Gian Battista Nolli at the time was in charge of the most important project ever done in that century, and there was not the realization of a building or a series of buildings, but the realization of the most important map of the city ever realized. The most precise, because for the first time uh, the map implied a complete survey of the city, measuring every corner, every building, every uh, piece of the built city in order to uh, produce what at the time was basically a cadastral plan, but a plan that had the role of projecting Rome into a European uh, context. In fact, at the time, Nolly realized that Rome was the only uh, um, important European capital missing an important map, and therefore he convinced the Pope to promote this project and to realize it. And what is important that this actually plan became um, in a way the representation of the zeitgeist of that period. Uh, and the idea that, that the most important idea behind it was that was a, a cadastral plan, was a topography of Rome, it was not just a map of Rome, it was a a very clear uh, scientific topography. In fact, the name was a new topography uh, of the city. And, um, uh, and in fact, Piranesi uh, was in, involved uh, in the project. And uh, in the next slide, uh, we can see that uh, um, actually the idea of the, the map was um, to represent not only the the most important buildings, the monuments, as was the case of the previous maps, but everything, even in the what at the time was the countryside, even if inside the perimeter of the Aurelian walls. Uh, Benedictus the Fourteenth was uh, the promoter, of course, of the map, and uh, um, and together with this project, Nolly was in charge of. Uh, of remounting <coughs> what was at the time a sort of mythical map of Rome, the famous Forma Urbis. Uh, um, a map was done during the imperial age, um, mainly uh, during the, um, the period of, of the emperor Septimius Severo, 200, beginning 200 after uh, Christ, and it was a map done uh, in 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 big uh, piece of marble, and Nolly was in charge of remounting those pieces in order to analyze them and to learn uh, from them. And Piranesi was part of, and was very much excited you know, to the idea that actually Rome was there. The ancient Rome was not just memory of the past of a ruin, but was a project exactly as the map was um, telling. Actually. Um, in a way, um, the interesting thing in this, uh, um, in this project of the Nolly map was that at, at the same time the idea of the map was to, uh, to make this survey, to, to produce a very scientific uh, and uh, efficient uh, um, product uh, that was very useful also for the economy of the city. In fact, through the cadastral plan, the state, the Pope, could manage very much, much better um, all their properties and control and enhance the economy of the, of the city. But at the same time, the map was a matter of representation. And in fact, um, Piranesi was immediately recognized as very 
uh, crucial no? in order to represent uh, in this figure that was um, made by the, his hands um, some of the important key uh, places um, of the city. So this dialectic between uh, a very scientific project, a very efficient project, and a very representational project was actually at the base uh, of the Nolly map. And there was something that, in a way, remained in Piranesi, um, in Piranesi uh, mind, even after uh, this project. Uh, this, this is the, the little map, actually. Uh, the, uh, the, the, it was published in, in 1743. Uh, and this map shows also another important thing that Rome at the time, um, Rome inside the walls, was made by two different, uh, completely different areas. On one side, the famous uh, uh, urban fabric that was treated as a, as a pochet, the, the center, basically the Campo Marzio, and on the other side, the, all the, the countryside, so to say, around it, even if inside the, um, the, the walls. In, in this countryside, not only couldn't have the possibility to go there and make a survey of all the ruins included, uh, many ruins actually uh, still existing. So he decided to take advantage of another map. A map was uh, drawn 150 years before by another important guy, Leonardo Bufalini, and this guy was actually the real inventor both of the pochet, it was not invented by Nolly, as normally people know, uh, but also the inventor of, of another attitude, now, the idea of, uh, that the city was a matter of, uh, of course, uh, urban fabric, the grey thing, but also uh, on the other side is a matter of, of important buildings, and this important building was at the same time building of the the present, but also and especially building of the past. So the Buffalini map, this one, was at the base um, we, we, uh, of this, of what Nolly couldn't do at the time for a lack of, of forces. That is the survey of all the existing ruins uh, uh, outside the city, uh, in, in the countryside. All these ruins, Buffalini uh, had, um, in a way, um, um, represented into, into his map. And mostly, as we can see, he tried to not only represent what was visible at the time, but also to imagine how the structure of the building could have been, even if not visible. So we see the whole structure imagined, of course, structure of the Circus Maximum or the, all the structure and, and the uh, configuration of, of the term uh, of the Caracalla bath. So all these things um, became very, very important for, for Nolly. And in fact, the first thing that uh, he asked uh, uh, his collaborators to do is to redraw the Fallini map ex um, exactly for uh, individuating all these um, elements on the countryside. And, and here we see that actually the image of Rome changed very much. Rome immediately was not anymore just the center, just the Campo Marx, it was some, but was something much larger. And Rome was a matter of a topograph topographical, uh, let's say, structure, no? much more dealing with its landscape than uh, merely with uh, his uh, urban structure. So um, these things uh, produce actually in the history another important uh, shift, and that was uh, an important, another important guy that became a, a crucial reference both for Nolly but more for Piranesi. It was Piero, Piero Ligorio. Piero Ligorio was an architect <coughs> from Naples. It's very interesting, actually, that all these archives that we are talking about are not Roman. So basically, the most important project about Rome, uh, this is something that uh, could be part of a research, specific research, was always done not by a Roman figure. Uh, Piranesi from Venice, Piero Ligorio 
from, from Naples and Bufalini from Udine and so on and Michelangelo and many others and uh, so Piero Ligorio was an architect was a famous for instance uh, the author of the Villa d'Este at Tivoli or the Bomarzo Gardens but was also an antiquarian he was really obsessed by antiquities at the time at, at the level that he was uh, accused by the Pope by have stolen things from the Vatican and he was basically condemned and uh, almost condemned and uh, obliged to escape. And uh, uh, in his career, Pio Rigorio uh, tried in, in a moment of uh, a very incredible obsession for the ancient Rome to re imagine the whole city of Rome. I don't know if you have you ever seen the, uh, the famous uh, model that is uh, in, the, um, uh, of, in the Museum of Roman Civilization, the DUR, the one done in the 30s. Huh? It was that represents the uh, Roman, uh, the situation of Rome during the Imperial Age. And this thing was something like that. But the problem was at the time uh, in uh, 1561, the knowledge about the Rome, ancient Rome was very, uh, very little, was in, in a way done by only the few things visible and, uh, uh, and the couple of uh, uh, materials, uh, documents uh, uh, existing at the time. So basically, this, pro this project, because it's, it's a project, you know, it's not just uh, uh, archaeology, you know? even the name archaeology was not invented uh, at the time, it was about inventing uh, a language of architecture that was able to represent uh, not only the, the major uh, well-known buildings like the Colosseum of the, uh, of the Circus uh, or, or some, somewhere there is the, the column um, the Antoninus uh, column, the one that's uh, nearby the, um, uh, the parliament, uh, or other important things. But the problem was, what, what was the, the image of the, the city, no? the, of, the, of the small pieces, no? of the regular uh, buildings in the city? And this image was incredibly, um, incredibly important in the imagination of architects and historians and uh, antiquarians because for the first time uh, he depicted the, the, what was the very difference from the ancient city and the modern city. And the difference was that the ancient city was done by means of buildings. Hmm? There was no streets, no roads, no urban fabric. Actually, the only means of construction of the city were, were buildings and, and uh, as we can see in the next slide, uh, even infrastructures like aqueducts or, or monuments uh, just combined one each other uh, with a, in a way with a, a, a sort of internal logic to the uh, building themselves. Um, and the logic that has nothing to do with was the typical logic of the medieval city and therefore of the modern city. You know, the, the dialectic between uh, streets and, 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 and urban fabric. So basically, um, uh, with, with, uh, um, with those kind of references, Piranesi, after, after having left uh, uh, Nolly's uh, workshop and having established his own workshop started uh, uh, in a way to um, to establish what he intended to be his real project mm -hmm. um, he realized that um, following the importance uh, of, uh, of the Nolly map and, and the project behind it that making prints, making etchings producing books was, could, could, have, could have been much more important than realizing buildings. This is actually true and, and false at the same time, uh, because maybe that uh, he had, um, he was also interested in architecture in a very direct way, but um, he decided to go for 
this particular uh, way of uh, working in the field of architecture because uh, he thought that, that, that in a way an image could uh, uh, speak much louder and much in a much more direct way uh, and in a much more precise way than, than, than a building. Um, among the very project that he started in a very few days, in very few years actually, because uh, um, we're talking about um, 1740 arriving in, uh, uh, in Rome when he was almost 20 years old, and then after uh, 15 years he was able to publish many, many different, many books, many, many prints, but also um, making a, a real project around them. And the first important project was, uh, um, was this, was a collection of four volumes called Le Antichità Romane, in which actually there is everything that we will see after in the Campo Marzio. What, what was the idea behind Le Antichità Romane, the Roman Antiquities? Um, that in a way, uh, first of all, that archaeology is not a matter of single, singular buildings, no? pieces, but it's a matter, it's an urban thing. It's something that, that, is, that implies a vision about the city. This is one of the very first plates of the first uh, volume in which we, we see immediately what uh, the statement uh, that uh, he proposed. Uh, Roman uh, Antiquità Romana is about the city of Rome and the city of Rome is exactly this. There is the perimeter proposed by the lonely map but it's a city without the modern times, no? without the modern buildings. It's a city we in a way that goes back to the very uh, basic topography of the city. The geography of the city uh, is what is the starting point uh, for Piranesi. So the, the hills, the river, and the walls, and uh, all around we see a reproduction of the forma urbis. So we have to start in a very archaeological way, in a very scientific way. That's, that is what um, um, Piranesi wants to propose to us. But if you go through the volumes, we discover that actually the idea of these antiquities, of these Roman antiquities, was at the same time talking about what was visible in the city. This is a very uh, clear uh, uh, example, the, the Pantheon. And a pantheon that is represented as um, a modern building that is in, in the modern reality. In fact, we see the two um, um, clock towers uh, put by Bernini and uh, that we know removed after a couple of years so that at the time were, were there. But you see, has uh, Piranesi cut the image in order to uh, try to represent the Pantheon in its uh, um, uh, ancient um, aspect as much as possible. And, and especially uh, removing also the rest of the background, creating this also false perspective that put in a very, very background what's the, uh, behind the, uh, the building in, around the piazza. Another um, but during the production of, of, of those four books, Piranesi goes even farther. Uh, in fact, he starts uh, investigating possible forms of ancient buildings that were not visible at the time, or only very, very partially visible. And uh, even if, we are, if you are not uh, an expert of Roman architecture, you can immediately uh, see how the imagination of Piranesi goes much further than what was the, the typical Roman architecture, no? what was even at the time known as Roman architecture. This, on, especially in the, in the left image, you see a rec possible reconstruction, tentative reconstruction of the plan of the Nymphaeus of Nero, uh, especially drawn uh, to 
evoke the, um, the, the fragments of the forma urbis, and here you see a tentative reconstruction uh, of the ancient Roman Forum in which you see very, very weird uh, forms you know, that, are, that nowadays we know were not possible at all uh, in, in the language of Roman architecture, but still uh, these for Piranesi were sort of exercises in order to uh, treat it as a very scientific archaeological inquiry, you know, not, not just as inventions. Uh, in, in this Antiquità Romana, Piranesi goes even further because actually the idea was not to uh, the idea was not to just uh, represent what was Rome uh, in the imperial age. The idea was to really defend Rome from which? From um, another kind of approach that for Milanesi was the evil at the time. It was the idea that Rome, that Roman culture was a product, a sub-product of Greek culture. This, is what, this was actually the big debate at the time. Uh, and especially in French culture, modern culture, uh, um, the, French, the, the culture was the sort of direct uh, uh, effect of the age of reason. The, the connection was very clear. Uh, Greek architecture, Greek culture, then Roman culture, then the rest. And for Pianesi that was not uh, admissible. Uh, Rome was a its own specificity, and in order to be defended from this, uh, um, according to him, not possible uh, reference to Greek architecture, he had to, in a way, discover something different. He had to grab uh, and to dig and grab elements that were not part of, of, of this uh, red line proposed by, uh, especially by the, the French uh, um, archaeological culture of, uh, of that period. And this frontispiece of the Antiquità Romana is a good example of that. Officially, this is the representation uh, of the uh, intersection between the Via Appia and Via Ardatina that is transformed into a collection uh, of weird uh, buildings and, and elements and, and sculptures and, and, and what will we see. And what was the atmosphere behind, behind this is not really Roman, no? in, the, in the sense of what today, for instance, we, we interpreted the Rome, in classical Rome culture, but it's something that goes behind. And we will see actually uh, where is this uh, uh, culture coming. And in terms of representation, uh, Piranesi had understood that the big difference between, uh, between what you want to propose and the traditional way of depicting, of painting, of, of drawing, um, could have been actually the sort of three-dimensional uh, effect uh, of the uh, of, of the plates, and he worked a lot about that. He worked in creating a sort of uh, chiaroscuro that emphasized very much uh, the three-dimensionality of the elements, transforming and even the, the small objects uh, sculpture into piece of architecture, into piece of buildings. Um, the other huge project that Piranesi um, in a way, um, enhanced and produced, and and, um, and and actually uh, um, invested a lot of money uh, by himself. Because uh, um, one thing that I I, I didn't um, say was that uh, the Antiquità Romana was uh, uh, the first. Um, um, series of books that was edited by Piranesi himself. So, so Piranesi was not just uh, the, the drawer, but was the printer, was the producer, was everything. Hmm? And so this was something very unique, even at the time, you know, because normally there was a big separation between uh, the different roles. 
Piranesi was uh, uh, interested in having everything under its control, everything. And that's why he started to produce a sort of a publisher house by himself. And uh, another huge project was this of the famous Vedute di Roma. In that case, the idea was talking about the city. This Vedute di Roma is a series, is a sort of counterpart of the Antichità Romana. Antichità Romana was about the past, Vedute di Roma is about the present. But this is something that, as we can see, was still about the past, was in a, in, in, in a way um, uh, the attempt of uh, showing has the past was something alive in the city, you know, in the configuration of the city, not only as a, as a function, of course, because a triumphal arc has no function, especially when it's partially buried as, as in the Roman Forum or a column, but in the next, you see that here, Piranesi work very, very much in the composition. You know? It shows that these elements are potentially architectural elements that can be used that can be instrumentalized for a possible project, even if it's, again, not, not uh, without any, any function. Um, the incredible uh, work that uh, he did in terms of, of, of the way the, the drawing and the plate is done is, again, this idea of creating very strong uh, difference between the foreground and the background. The background is really black. No? Uh, is, most, is almost vanishing here, as, as we see here, while the foreground is incredibly in the front line, no? uh, um, almost in, in the eye uh, of the observer. And even uh, in, in the most uh, um, in the normal basic uh, um, um, subjects like, like uh, like the, the famous um, Piazza San Pietro, we have to uh, remember that at the time those plates were basically like postcards. You know? People buy, used to buy it as, as today we, we buy postcards. Today we don't buy any more postcards. But in a way, it's some, it's, they, they were souvenirs. Hmm? So um, for, for Piranesi, those souvenirs were the best way of penetrating into the culture of the everyday of people of the everyday culture, not, not to just remain into, into the culture of the elites. But the way even the most trivial, so to say, subject is treated by creating a, again this very strong difference between the background and the foreground and putting in very strong evidence the form of the building, separating it by the context is, is at the base of this uh, 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 project. And for instance, here the perspective is completely uh, false. No, it's, it's not, it do not in a way uh, represent what the piazza was at the time. Uh, the obelisk is much bigger than it was, and and uh, and the mud is much mu was much in a way emphasize in order to isolate those three buildings like floating you know, in the middle of... Uh, this is actually something that reminds me very much of the Super Studio uh, picture that Cristiano shows. No? Uh, uh, and look at this Colosseum in which uh, this is the size of the plate, of, of the side, no? in which actually it is uh, uh, represented as so big that even doesn't fit in, in, in the plate. You know? uh, or, uh, and, and look, look at, the, at the people inside, they are incredibly small, you know, in order uh, to, to emphasize the, the bigness uh, of, the, of the building. And the next one, uh, yeah, also the famous pyramid by Caio Cestius uh, was actually not, not the most important monuments in, in the city, but still here is treated as a, as a, a very glorious uh, uh, relic of the past and uh, put in the, in the foreground and emphasized as much as possible. Or the next, uh, if I'm not wrong, yeah, the... Um, 
the arch of Septimius, uh, the uh, of Constantine, and or Titus, uh, and uh, and the next one is uh, again the Pantheon, still with the horrible uh, clock towers by Bernini, but uh, I completely isolated uh, from the, from from the context that we can barely uh, see. Um, you see that all these <coughs> views of Rome, of course, are in the selection, it's a bit instrumental that I've done, but not so much. Actually, um, present those buildings as a sort of catalog you know, of, of forms, forms that talk about the past, of the present, and, and in a way those forms, uh, according to Piranesi, <coughs> be become ideally you know, a sort of grammar for a city that actually uh, become the project uh, of the Campo Marzio uh, dell'Antica Roma that was done, published in 1762. Um, and actually the idea uh, here is to continue in a way what the, the, the job that Piranesi started to do with the Antichità Romane but in a much more systematic way, uh, dealing not simply with this or that building, but with the city of Rome as a whole. And the city of Rome treated as a specific city, so the part of the city that is the Campo Marzio intended to be um, uh, the center, uh, uh, in a way, um, of the city, the, the origin uh, of the city, but also a possible project for the future of the city. And this is something actually very um, unique, even in, in Piranesi's career. In fact, actually, <clears throat> the idea of the Campo Marzio was to start again from scratch, from, uh, again from the idea that was behind the, the Nolly map, which I to, that is to read Rome from, first of all, from its topographical um, um, aspect. Photography for, for Piranesi means to, uh, to start from scratch, you know, to start from the ground. The ground for Piranesi is really it's like a sort of nomos. You know? uh, it's something that uh, is a sort of guarantee for the origin uh, of the Roman culture. And therefore uh, the river, Tiber and the hills uh, and some aqueducts uh, uh, and uh, de become um, um, the, the, the starting point for a very, very analytical map, incredibly modern. You know? uh, and look at, at how the, the city is represented, no, but only by means of very uh, few elements and uh, a legend of uh, um, letters and numbers that represent the most important uh, existing ruins. Uh, only few of them is represented as they were, like the Circus uh, Agonale, namely Piazza Navona, but the rest are just uh, letters. You know? Just to say that what is important is just to understand in a very scientific way what is this and what is that. So, um, this was the first act hmm, of a narrative, a very strong narrative that was behind the Campo Marzo. Campo Marzo is a story, it's a story of Rome, in a way. And the story starts from the topography and go on with the second act uh, of this uh, uh, story, that is the, uh, the scenography. And the scenography shows um, what is still there of the past, of Rome, now. So, it's like to have a sort of very, uh, very weird bomb that demolish and destroy everything is modern and leave intact uh, everything was uh, belonging to the past, to the glorious past of the imperial city. And so, well, in this scenografia, you will see the Campo Mars reduced into a tabula rasa, in which all the things that are numbered and represented are the rest 
for instance, of the Pantheon, of course, on the rest of the Circus Agonale, the rest of the Theater of Pompeo, the rest of the Column of Antonino Pio, and some temples, some things. As you can see, there is very few things, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, the knowledge Piranesi had at the time was just what is, was visible. And he's, he was interested in, in what, in a way, was, was visible and was underneath the urban fabric. And in fact, actually, uh, this, the, the, the plates that illustrate uh, this phase, this moment of the project, are exactly reproducing a sort of incredibly eloquent, uh, even if fictional city of Rome, in which the city center is inhabited, because there are people wandering, but in which everything was demolished, removed, and only the uh, this presence of the past are still there, visible, alive, in a way, started, ready for, for becoming something else. This is the, um, a view um, um, of the, what today is Piazza di Pietra, uh, with the, the rest of the column, and you see that, of course, it's not visible right now, but if you remove uh, the urban fabric you can see in the background the Pantheon. Or uh, the next one, uh, look, this is actually an image that shows the, the, what was the book, actually all these things was a book, when, so it's very much uh, emphasizing also the narrative. And uh, this is an image of the theater of Pompeo. Today actually the form of the theater is visible in some of the piazza nearby, I don't remember what's the name of the piazza, but uh, it's nearby Campo di Fiori. And, uh, and, and you see that the presence of those people in the middle uh, are there to say that this is not just ruins, it's something more. And, and after a series of images like that, there are many more, arrives the third, uh, the third uh, moment, you know, the final moment, the moment uh, of the project. And in fact, actually, w with a very, very uh, big jump, in a way, uh, we could call it the grip, uh, the grip leap forward of Piranesi, because actually the iconographia is much more than the completion of the voids, hmm? and it's, uh, as we will see immediately. Uh, it arrives the iconographia that is the, the plan, actually. Um, in reality, uh, Piranesi decided to, to represent this third phase uh, as, a, as, a, uh, yes, as a plan, mostly a, a huge plan, actually made in different uh, sheets, and, and here that here we see recomposed. Um, because actually the plan was uh, exactly as the Nolly map you know, was the, not only the, the best representation of what the city was but also was the most uh, efficient way of promoting what the city could have been and it's very very interesting that uh, um, what we see here uh, in a way it's a kind of city um, in which everything that we have seen before is, in a way, um, overcome by another logic, the, the logic of, of the sort of internal grammar of the buildings. Um, in a way, um, even if the, the project was done in very few years, there is a big jump from, from the scenographia, from the topographia to the scenographia and to the iconographia. And this is the, a jump that uh, imply uh, a, a, an incredible invention you know, about uh, what the city could have been and, and what, what kind of imagination we can include uh, in order to fill the gap you know, between what we see, what we can understand, what we can discover, and what we have to imagine in order to arrive to, the, to this uh, ima final image. Um, but the funniest thing, and it's actually my only, uh, I would say, um, 
uh, extra proposal of the of this lecture, something that I, I haven't re read in any book, but still to me seems quite interesting, at least to, to investigate. Is that the center uh, of this map is not the Campo Marzio. So actually the Campo Marzio, if we uh, if you have in mind the, the null map, but the Campo Marzio is, is this, hmm? is this part. This is the Tiber, no, the Campo Marzio is this part here. So the strange thing of this map, first of all, is that um, the, the map has not the orientation of the null map. Hmm? It's, a, it's a different orientation that put more in evidence what exists in the other side of the Campo Marzio, on the other side of the, of the river, of the Tiber. And in fact, actually, what is in the other side of the Tiber is this, that giant square uh, thing that, uh, um, uh, that corresponds to what some way um, Piranesi called Campo Vaticano. In a way, what is there uh, correspond to what at the time was the, the uh, St. Peter's uh, Cathedral uh, Church uh, and the Vatican area. And it's very interesting that, um, uh, uh, yes, this is the, the, the center uh, of the Campo Marzio, uh, and, and, and this is interesting that um, actually Piranesi seems to put more and more emphasis in this part, and in fact, actually, this part is the only part in which the, the, homogene, the, the very, very homogeneous pattern of buildings is uh, uh, changed in favor of a big, giant, uh, uh, monumental uh, complex that is actually also uh, the complex that is used for the frontispiece uh, of the book that actually you, you can see in original plate coming directly from my house over there. So I have every, these things every day in front of. And, um, and I realized that though it was very strange to talk about the Campo Marzio dell'Antica Roma showing something that is not the Campo Marzio because actually it's the other side of the river, the Campo Vaticano. And, and actually it's very interesting that um, trying to investigate what, 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 what was behind uh, uh, those three-dimensional representations. Actually, in the whole book, there are very, very few three-dimensional representations of the, of the whole project. There are just uh, three or four plates. Uh, this is the most important. Then there are three more. One is the pan about the Pantheon. The one is about the reconstruction of the Teatro di Marcello. And the, third, the fourth one, I don't remember, but it's very little ones and, and of minor importance, clearly. Why all this was uh, evidently more, more important. Um, and if we, if we try to go through those uh, things, uh, we immediately realize, even not knowing anything about Roman architecture, that, that the language they use here is something slightly different from what was the traditional Roman architecture and in fact um, and, and first of all we, 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 real, we can realize that there is a, and this is also uh, some, some historians have uh, noted uh, an, an, an in, very interesting relationship with, uh, with Piero Ligorio's map the ones that we have seen that exactly in the same part uh, of the city uh, represent the bridge that connects uh, um, uh, the Campo Marzio with the Campo Vaticano and a big building that is, has the, the form of this uh, very um, weird uh, um, uh, tower at different levels um, and, but also in a way the, the composition, no? the, the logic of the composition uh, of the two images is, is very very <coughs> Uh, close, very, very, I mean, they are very much related to one, one each other, even if this is more perspectival, of course, more precise. But if you go through, we can um, note other in 
reference that are in a way very much distant, apparently, from the what we, we can we could imagine being the tradition of Roman architecture. And references like Fischer von Erlach was the uh, the um, the famous Austrian architect that uh, investigated uh, very much the, the uh, those kind of uh, architecture of the Oriental um, um, areas. Uh, he, that, for instance, in 1721 published a book called uh, Entwurf einer historischen Architektur, in which there was a whole set of uh, um, a reconstruction that he called Spectacula Babylonica it was about the, the, the mythic uh, Babylon, uh, one of the, the most uh, important cities of the past and less known. But also um, um, another important reference, of course, is this tower. And this tower is uh, inevitably uh, related to to one of the most interesting and uh, known uh, representation of the, the famous Tower of, of Babel, uh, yeah, namely the one um, um, designed uh, by Athanasius Kircher. The, the plate in reality is done by another person by, uh, after a drawing by Athanasius Kircher. Uh, Athanasius Kircher was an interesting guy in a way because uh, at the time was the um, so it was a Jesuit, was a philosopher, was a sort of Leonardo da Vinci of the uh, 17th century. He was the last guy to able to counterpose the, the, the culture of the age of reason, no? the culture, the culture of, of uh, the Cartesian culture, no? the culture in which everything is divided into disciplines no? in a very scientific way. Uh, Athanasius Kirke was uh, probably the, the champion of the only, a, a very holistic way of looking at, 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 at culture and in fact he was very much interested uh, even if exactly because Jesuit into, uh, into the oriental culture and make it, uh, was an expert of jeroglyphic uh, 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 writings and, and things like that. And so it's very, very interesting that uh, in the reference uh, of Piranesi, in order to fight against this idea that the red line was Greek, Greece, Rome, and France, you know? uh, a, a line that in a way um, was too, um, in a way too easy for Piranesi because it was lacking of the background uh, in a way, a symbolic background that uh, he imagined was attached to Roman culture. Um, he used those, those re references uh, in, in, in this very direct way. In order to do that, in order to do a project that was directly, uh, in a way, directed to, to the power, to the political power of the time, because implicitly this was uh, something that had, uh, in a way, the Pope as a counterpart. You know? If you want to become you know, uh, the emperor of a new Rome in Poland, you have to, uh, you have to use the right architecture, you have to use the right uh, references, you have to use the right language. So this idea of uh, um, in a way, um, using the, the field of representation by not directly proposing uh, simply projects to, 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 to be done, but in a way to uh, convince uh, the political power to take a different direction, in a way. That was actually the big uh, and, uh, effort uh, made by uh, Piranesi. Uh, this is a postscriptum of a few slides um, because uh, I, I would have uh, actually concluded here, but I asked myself, and then that uh, actually before uh, leaving uh, for the famous Voyage d'Orient, Piranesi had actually 
meticulously uh, uh, studied. Uh, um, and Le Corbusier had really, really super precisely studied uh, many, many Piranesi uh, plates and, and uh, Piranesi prints uh, that were at the time uh, in the collection of the National the Bibliothèque de France in Paris. So he used Piranesi to prepare his uh, part of the um, trip to Rome, redrawing many of the plates we have, of the prints that we have seen uh, before, and using actually this, uh, let's say, approach to, um, uh, in a way, to propose also his idea uh, that Rome can be understood only by isolating uh, simple forms uh, as uh, objects that can be in a way valid uh, despite the, the real function that they have. Um, and in fact, actually, the, the end uh, uh, of the chapter uh, about uh, uh, Rome in Berson Architecture is the famous Sequence of, of uh, Boolean um, solids compared with a sketch uh, of, made by Le Corbusier uh, reproducing uh, part, uh, exactly that part of the Piro Ligorio's map that was the one that we were talking about. And this is something that Le Corbusier never, in a way, acknowledged in a very direct way. Uh, the, whole, the very few words that uh, he officially used uh, for Piranesi was, ah, Piranesi was the hell because uh, it's about the past and the past is, is, is bad and we have to go on for the future and so on. But in a way here there is something more than, than, than a reference. Grazie. Siete in diretta mondiale. Please. Well, I want to thank you very much for this, uh, this lecture, very interesting. And, well, in a parenthesis, in Sapienza University is still Piranesi, is kind of unknown. But having said that, I have a question concerning what you mentioned at the very beginning, and I knew somehow um, developed at the end, which is about the personal uh, project of Piranesi. So Piranesi as a man. And uh, of course there is a, I mean, a bunch of imagination here. It's not just about, of course, I mean, beyond this temporal just supposition of the things that he does uh, in his uh, drawings. Um, I have the feeling that there is something more personal somehow, more about the man that encounters a city that is not his city. So the sort of internalization of a condition um, of these ruins and so on, which is, I mean, the desolation of uh, the of the scenografia, if I'm not mistaken, uh, somehow uh, suggests a sort of internal, let's say, conditions. Let's say, uh, having said that, I also have another question that has to do with. Uh, the fragmentary nature of what he represents. Meaning, for example, in the Antiquita, these sort of uh, elements and pieces upon which he draws and they're placed and isolated in a sort of neutral background. So if you could talk up more about these, these issues, would be. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> the problem uh, of the, the figure uh, was, of course, uh, Quite relevant because of a, Piranesi used to be a very difficult person, very, very um, character, incredibly difficult, incredibly suspicious against everyone. Actually, the whole uh, uh, the whole career was punctuated by uh, anecdotes and episodes in which he was dealing with people that was against this, against that, and and it's. I mean, it w was really part of his. Uh, um, kind of approach to, to his work. And even the fact of doing everything by himself, 
that produced the fact that he died actually <laughs> while uh, survey, trying to survey uh, ruins in, in Pestum and uh, in, in, in all over the south of Italy. It uh, was about um, yeah um, the, the uh, that of course uh, everything is in a way in 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 the frame of a, a very peculiar aspect that we can in a way see we can we can talk about the psychology uh, of, of this kind of architecture but at the same time I think this is something that belongs to a way of being artist you know, many artists are a bit reluctant in sharing. Uh, even if they want to share, they want to be uh, uh, in a way recognized, but at the same time they, they want to maintain the point. And Piranesi was really incredibly maintaining the point until the very end of his career. Um, on the other side, uh, yeah, the fragment, the, the idea of the fragments is something that um, is interesting because uh, um, Tafuri spoke uh, while talking about the Campo Marzio as the beginning of the avant-garde, basically, as the, um, the desperate attempt to recombine the fragments. And in effect, the Campo Marzio can be seen, of course, as a, as a desperate recombination of fragments, but at the same time, what I find more, in a way, uh, even more clear, uh, in, especially in, in, in this shift between the Campo Marzio itself and the logic of the Campo Vaticano, and in which there is a, a sort of um, kind of serenity, no? in which it's not just the obsessive uh, uh, combination of things. We can go back to to the to the plan of the Suleknografia to show uh, better this um, yeah um, the difference between here and there um, um, to me uh, is it, it, something that can uh, let us imagine that um, um, Piranesi had a project and it was very simple at the end. Now, Roman architecture is made uh, with very specific tools and these tools uh, must be recognized uh, and in a way promoted. Uh, and these tools are not simply... Uh, so the problem is not just to recombine ancient things. Um, from that point of view, uh, I think that Piranesi is not a sort of John Stone uh, of that century. You know? um, uh, he has a very strong project in mind. He accepts that uh, in order you have to remove things and you have to take other things coming from the, uh, the importance of imagination in this, pro in this project goes much further than, than the simple inquiry. So archaeology is something that uh, for Piranesi is very much a matter of imagination. And there is an anecdote that is also important, that the very year in which uh, uh, the Antichità Romane were published, 1756, in that year um, arrived in Rome Winkelmann, the master of uh, archaeology, uh, the, the depository of the, of the of archaeology as a mother of Greece, of Greek architecture, of uh, um, of that kind of world. And we, uh, here in Rome, not just to make a trip, but just to promote his way of doing was in, in contact with, with, with many people and uh, he was able to penetrate through different uh, connection uh, talking directly with the Pope uh, and promoting his approach and Pianesi was absolutely against this so um, um, in a way 
uh, this project is also, um, to me, um, a very strong, uh, even provocative uh, attempt to, to shift the focus from this classical uh, view uh, of the tradition, that of course is the relationship between Greek, Greece and Rome, with mythical combination in which Egypt, uh, Babylonia, Mesopotamia and uh, Nineveh and mythical cities are become a sort of uh, ideal reference you know, for, for a project that is a brand new project at the end, making, made for a brand new city and not just in a way uh, it's, in a way the idea here is to just to forget the Campo Marzio ideally, and concentrate to, with another thing. It is something that, in a way, to me, reminds me what was the approach of Le Corbusier with Paris, with the Plan Voisin, in which dealing with the city center do not mean to remove the city center, but just to build a site, yeah? remove many parts of the city, namely the Marais, but taking all the big monuments and, and in a way dealing with them, you not know, trying to create a dialectic. And that in a way this is something that, uh, uh, and, and, and especially the whole project to me resonates of the idea that the city uh, is treated as a wall. No, it's not just a sequence uh, of, of buildings. Uh, the attempt is to create a hierarchy between things, uh, and uh, the important elements, for instance, is the is the Tiber. The Tiber as an infrastructure, uh, and the infrastructure we know that uh, uh, the strong uh, power of Roman of the Roman age was the possibility of using the Tiber as an infrastructure. No? By in a very very the the, the, the Romans had uh, designed the whole and designed and realized that the whole banks of the of the Tiber from the city center to Ostia in order to uh, to let ships uh, navigate and, and bring. So um, Biranesi was interested in the infrastructure also uh, of the Roman architecture, not only in the big monuments, he was interested in, uh, in, the, in the world, in, in, uh, in, in many, many very basic infrastructure that, according to him, could guarantee an international level. So it was not just a matter of style. Uh, and maybe that's, uh, the problem of the style was the less important for Piranesi. In fact, actually, if, you go, if we look closely to all these things, uh, we, we see an incredible amount of very different references, from Egypt to Asia, from Rome to Greece, even no, in Greece, not, not Greece, but Etruscan architecture, there is everything. So it's a very eclectic project from that point of view, but it's very strongly uh, pointing to what was, according to him, important. Uh, strong uh, topographical reference, strong infrastructural uh, um, points and, and lines and uh, uh, orientations and uh, above all uh, strong monuments, strong, strong buildings, no? in really, in, yeah. so, so fragments were of course uh, uh, instrumental to, to this project. Okay, I'm not sure this is a question, but following your um, presentation, um, from my point of view, something came out in the sense that when you look at the plans, you always have this um, idea of accumulations. Probably, of course, also just a position of things. But then, when you look at the vedute, so the image of the city, you always have this idea of isolations. That actually is completely the contrary in a certain way. And um, so, thanks to the plan, you can really understand that the meaning of the city and uh, also this idea that the accumulation of objects become one project. But then, in the image, you completely erase this aspect 
and uh, you look at the building as something that actually not doesn't belong but have a different um, behavior and also a different relationship with the surrounding, with the background, so with the, the meaning of the city itself. Do, do you think that there is a strategy related with this or is something that was just uh, an instrument to explain better the, the importance of the building? I don't know, there is something strange that for me is the first time that come out uh, so clearly. I think that the problem that according to Piranesi, as according actually to uh, everyone that knows Roman architecture uh, very well, Roman architecture was about the interior space. It was not just about the exterior space. That's a big difference from Greek architecture. Now, Greek architecture are, were mostly objects in the landscape, in the city. Um, while Roman architecture started from the other way around, that actually we have to um, frame space, and the, sp and, and the space uh, uh, is inhabitable, is valid when it's framed, was, when it's treated as an interior. Uh, the forum is, a, of course, a, the best representation of this, um, but also, in a way, uh, m most of the buildings, uh, like the thermal bath, uh, and even the even the the, the, the buildings that are, um, in a way, uh, treated as open spaces, like the circ uh, like a circus, are basically interior spaces. And and this is actually the big difference from from the modern city. Uh, the Nolly map showed a, a city in which there was a big difference between the interior space and the exterior space, and all the streets represented a domain that separates clearly what is here and what is there. But at the same time, the idea was to create a, a new kind of space, with the space of the piazza, not the space, the public space, basically. Um, while the Roman, uh, uh, the ancient, according to Piranesi, but I mean, we know that it was the case uh, nowadays that we know very well how the Roman city worked. Uh, in, the Roman, in the Roman city, um, in a way, everything was public space. Uh, everything was treated as a as a, something that is as a, an interior and has an interior as a public nature, not as an exterior. That's the big difference. And I think that this implies a, a, a quite um, huge difficulty in representing the city from the traditional means, you know, like an, an axonometric or a perspective in which traditionally we, we see the exterior of the buildings. This is the paradox. Uh, so basically um, what Piranesi, I think that this is mostly why Piranesi used the, uh, the plan as a medium uh, to represent the city instead of a bird's eye view. Using the bird's eye view only for a close up in a way, you know, for uh, detail, for some details. Um, I don't know if I answered to the West. No, but it's nice what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Same feeling as you, um, well, because you sometimes I get like, <laughs> on plan, but sometimes maybe um, uh, because of the scale. Sorry, it's like on plan, it's too like the project looks like a big building, because uh, the the street inside and the street outside are the same same uh, width or same uh, things. So, in fact, the all. Um, a fragment uh, seems to merge, but when you see the perspective, it's more isolated, and you can clearly see the boundary of uh, of one building and another one. If we put the image of the of one of the perspectives that yeah. he, so, but when you say that there is uh, some view from inside, it's true. Like it's maybe a, things from the scale. 
Mm. Yeah, for anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, actually, if you go... Uh, uh, no, uh, go on. Yeah. I think that there is a big difference between this image, that was the basically the... Mm. Uh, the, 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 the part of the, the Campo March, you know, with the, the Isola Tiberina and the Theater of Pompeo and the Pantheon you know, over there, and the next one, the next one, that's this. You know? So this is one giant building organized in different parts. And the, the, fir the, the first one was uh, a combination of, of things, no? It was a combination of, of, of different things. So, um, I think that, um, um, in a way, <laughs> this is pure speculation, <laughs> but my, my uh, in, in using as a, in giving importance in the, in the second one, Maybe that Piranese was trying to propose a way of, in a way, overcoming these things. No, the, like to say that this is the phase one, and the, after the phase one, there is a phase two. That to, to me also could it makes sense. No, it could correspond to the idea that there is, a, in a way, a power able to control this chaos, and, and the power is represented by the big palace of the Campo Vaticano. So the chaos is this, but the chaos in a way is uh, something that in a way had to be controlled, had to be um, organized, managed. It's not just chaos for chaos. That, that also makes Piranesi less avant-garde than Tafuri would <laughs> propose, but uh, uh, to me it's much, it's a bit more realistic to, to what was the kind of hierarchy of powers at the time, in which, uh, I mean, those things are, I mean, not this, but are, um, of course, are a matter of uh, culture and therefore an internal discussion or in cultural circles between antiquarians uh, and, uh, and architects and so on, but this is also a matter of uh, political power, no? because actually as an architect, if you want to do something, you have to deal with this power. So. Um, I think that here Piranesi is, uh, tries to give uh, a sort of direction. It's not just to... And it, this is an effect also in, in, the, in the way we can, we can read uh, differences between uh, things. I don't know. I have a question from New York. Of course. <laughs> Okay, is Alessandro Sini from New York asks, it's also the fact that in Piranesi the connectivity between the different buildings is just the result of the sequence of the interior spaces? Um, yeah. yeah, in the Antichità Romane Piranesi made uh, a lot of tests about how to design and connect things. Now there are, we have seen some, just uh, two examples, but there are many, many, um, many, many projects, many, many buildings that are represented in order to verify uh, the logic of this, uh, of this architectural grammar. And um, it's a pity that I haven't, uh, um, in this uh, slideshow, the, the other um, bird's eye view, the one with the Pantheon, in which, uh, um, in a way, these things it's a bit uh, um, um, explained. In, uh, there is the buildings appear as a building. The, the two slide, the, the the views are of this two uh, theater, the theater of Marcello and the theater of uh, Balbo. 
at the Pantheon. And, um, and here we see that it's not just a, a continuous pattern of the same things, but the two theaters are two theaters. You realize that two big buildings, why all, everything around it uh, has a different uh, thing. Still, still, the, na the nature of those uh, uh, spaces, like the theater, of course, is a nature of, of interior spaces, uh, which uh, there is a kind of difficulty in showing what, what was the envelope. And this is something that's uh, inevitably embedded into the, into the Roman architecture. And in fact, actually, those was the limit of the Piero Ligorio. Piero Ligorio was uh, showing a, a very weird uh, Roman architecture. <laughs> it was a sort of strange uh, uh, assemble of uh, monuments that, that was much more related to what uh, was visible at the time. So, towers, uh, blocks, no? and um, instead of uh, interior spaces. Peter. You are the only one that's able to speak properly. Oh, the, you, you have to sit here. Oh, okay, because otherwise it's going to... It's a great talk, and uh, I really learned a lot, Camille, so uh, I'm, I'm really felt like I was returned to Rome. But what, bring, what, what this brings up is, um, I was thinking about Freud, uh, because um, in Civilization and its Discontents, he mentions Rome. And uh, it's a parable for him for uh, the mental and um, how we understand memory and how we understand um, our, our own psychosis. So, I mean, I, I would add that dimension to reading this um, these maps because I find them on, on many levels to be talking about also our own way of thinking and our own mind and how this composes a series of, of um, yeah, uh, very strong uh, impressions that harken back to, to both our, yeah, um, primal understanding of ourselves and also how we can picture uh, where we're going. So, I mean, it's... Uh... Maybe that's a comment. <laughs> no, it, it's true in the sense that um, um, actually what, uh, what we... the feeling we have when we see um, stuff like that, uh, having been... Um, for centuries, um, uh, having in mind for centuries a kind of map that is done exactly as an only map, basically. So we are the result of the only map. Our minds look at plans exactly as the only map is done, in the sort of binary, binary uh, things in which there is black and white, black and white, good and bad. Um, while Piranesi is proposing something that in which we, we, we cannot identify what is good or what is bad, what is important, what is less important, what is uh, in, what is out. Um, and for sure, um, uh, I think that Freud uh, is useful exactly as a uh, that was Tafuri, actually. Uh, Tafuri's approach to, to Piranesi was the result of Freud, as we know. Um, but the problem is that Piranesi was so much convinced um, that the past was not inevitably linked and condemned to be the past. But the past was something that was, could, could have been still alive and, and usable. Um, that uh, uh, creates, in a way, uh, in, us, in, in, in our view, and that, that was why, actually, he purposely um, merged the views of the real city with the views of the ancient hypothetical city. There was an incredibly uh, incredibly vast area of merging of the two worlds, and it was was that 
explicitly, no? because in order to demonstrate, look guys, we are, we are in the ancient city, we are not in a new world. Ancient city is here, no? in the Colosseum, in the Pantheon, but it's not here just as a relics, as a ruins, as a pieces no? uh, in the middle of uh, urban modern fabric. It's, they are, um, in a way, a premonition of a new possible identity. There of course was the old identity, but it's something that can be new. And actually, uh, if, you, if we, uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, would uh, compare this map with uh, whatever reconstruction, uh, modern reconstruction of the ancient city, for instance, the map that was at the base of the, um, of the model uh, of the imperial Rome, the one of modern uh, Roman civilization, actually is this. It's exactly this. Of course, it's not this in the sense that this is different, there is much more imagination, but the logic of the city made only by a combination of uh, interior spaces, of forums, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, in a way, particles. For instance, the particle. The particle is something that, of course, is part of modern cities, but uh, mostly in Rome is uh, unknown. No, there are no particles in Rome. Um, and, and of course, this is a city made by huge, vast areas of porticos instead of streets. And porticos are in between, are bu buildings and not buildings. Um, this is just one reference, simple things. But also, of course, there are in typologies that, that do not represent at all the modern life, like circus. No, but we know that uh, Circus Maximum is still uh, incredibly used and, uh, and very usable and very very functional thing. Mm. Uh, or thermal bath, of course, is uh, something that... Uh, or even those spaces that were used for military purposes, because we have to remember that actually the Campo Marzio has a peculiarity of the, that is being a, a place not for residential buildings. There are no houses, no. So the very, of course, paradox of the Campo Marzio is it's a, it's a city without houses in a world that is made basically only by houses because modern world and the only map was a, the, the starting point of this is a, the city that is made firstly by houses and then some monuments here and there, some piazzas. So, of course, uh, this is a kind of city that doesn't exist, but actually this is a city that exists in the in the whole the huge uh, monumental places all over the world made in the in the last 20 in the last 200 uh, years you know, in the in the Champ de Mars in, in Paris of course it's actually this bigger actually or in in the Washington that I see in my prefer the series House of Cards uh, uh, or, or, uh, I mean, all over the world there are big uh, uh, Chandigarh. No, the problem is that here everything is concentrated uh, uh, and uh, is put under the light as the unique point of, of, of importance of the project. But this is not actually the project of Rome. This is a project of Campo Marzo dell'Antica Roma. So Piranesi was not saying that we have to live in the in the Pantheon. He was saying that this is actually the project for a city center. Downtown, yeah, this is downtown Rome. Anybody from Australia? From... No. Ah, PD. No, but because that's for the fuso horario, for the yeah. time, it's not the right one. <laughs> 
No, it's good for them. We're right now. What, what time is in your right now? It's eight, well, they're 2.30, 3.30. They're doing the, um, right now, the, the sessions is being interrogated. Right. We have to go. We have to go and watch that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to debate, study and celebrate architecture.